Hello friends, good afternoon. Welcome to CEC EduSat lecture. Friends, continuing with our lecture series on Western political thoughts. Today's topic for discussion is political thought of Hegel. And to take this lecture, we have our subject expert Dr. Satish Kumar Jha with us. Dr. Jha is an associate professor, Department of Political Science, Aryabhat College, University of Delhi. He has expertise in uh, uh, Indian politics and uh, political thought. Now I would like welcome to welcome Dr. Jha to our studio and request him to begin his lecture. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you, Ashmita. Uh, uh, today's uh, lecture we are going to have on the political thought of George William Frederick Hegel, popularly known as Hegel, uh, and his contributions uh, in you know the whole corpus of ideas which we know as political thought. In fact, Hegel is one of the most eminent uh, modern political thinker who has influenced uh, actual course of political events uh, since he uh, you know, wrote and uh, talked and basically articulated uh, his ideas uh, sometime in uh, you know, 18th century and early 19th century. His time period was between 1770 to 1831. A German philosopher who is credited with giving rise to and laying foundation of uh, many new ideas, many new trends and many new approaches uh, in the realm of philosophy and political thought. His influence has been so varied that he has not only uh, basically influenced and determine uh, you know, the contours of political thought in, in Europe, but his contributions for the understanding of freedom, for the understanding of state, for civil society and for many institutions are acknowledged all over the world. Of course, Hegel is remembered as an idealist thinker who considered ideas to be the driving force of history and combined it with a method which of course he was not the originator, but he made use of it in a new way and that is dialectical idealism. Now this dialectics as we have seen in our earlier lecture was also used by the Greek thinkers, most notably Plato. And it was basically known to the ancient period and many scholars believe that even in ancient Indian political thought, even if this dialectics as a method may not have been there clearly as it is normally understood, but nonetheless understanding of reality in a dialectical fashion was quite common here as well. But you know, so far as the West is concerned, definitely you know the Greek thinkers uh, were quite familiar and they talked of, they made use of this dialectical method and Hegel not only popularized it, but made it in a particular way which basically created a tradition of dialectical reasoning and dialectical thinking. So much so that one of the most, uh, one of uh, you know the very eminent and uh, political thinker of modern time, Karl Marx, uh, you know basically uh, borrowed it from Hegel and uh, basically used it in his uh, writings, in his ideas, in his thought, of course also transformed it. For example, it is a common, it, it is quite common or it is basically this statement is quite popular that Marx uh, uh, made that you know Hegel's ideas were standing on its head and I simply uh, put them, uh, you, know, uh, you know, put them on their feet. So basically turned it upside down uh, and you know, but nonetheless he acknowledged the contribution of Hegel. Many people even believe that you know the Marx, uh, you know he, Hegel was Marx's intellectual, you know mentor uh, if not directly, but in terms of the contributions he made in shaping some of his methodological uh, formulations. Of course, whereas Hegel talked of idea as a driving force of history and therefore is remembered as idealist thinker. Marx of course uh, did not subscribe to that uh, viewpoint and he transformed it 
and replaced it with matter. And therefore, uh, whereas uh, Hegel's dialectical, uh, you know, his ideas or his method is known as dialectical idealism, Marx's method is known as dialectical materialism. And the materialist part, the materialist interpretation of history, Marx borrowed not from Hegel, but from other uh, predecessors, other thinkers. So, but nonetheless, this dialectical part is quite significant. So, therefore, uh, in fact, Hegel's ideas uh, to some extent one can find continuing with this Marxist tradition in terms of this dialectics. On the other hand, Hegel's uh, continuity can also be seen in terms of certain other European thinkers uh, whose ideas uh, at times are also seem to be uh, very closer to uh, you know the liberal ideas, uh, but nonetheless they are recognized as idealist thinker. Uh, because of certain uh, you know arguments which they put forth, particularly in support of a state. For example, Green, a uh, British thinker and uh, he basically laid the foundation for a, a kind of positive state or the positive role of a state within broadly you know liberal uh, discourse and uh, the way you know he talked about many people uh, believe or many people call him idealist and therefore, one can one finds also some sort of continuity or influence of Hegel uh, on liberal thought through Green. So, that is one thing, but even in terms of the actual political you know discourse, uh, you know lot of people believe that the way uh, Hegel you know glamorized or glorified the state and state power, uh, of course, within a, his own framework that framework we will be discussing later, but was responsible for the rise of totalitarianism in modern times or authoritarianism or the absolutist state. For example, uh, its uh, fuller expression uh, was in Mussolini's Italy and Hitler's Germany. So, that type of totalitarianism many people believe that was a culmination of uh, Hegelian thought, the way he uh, basically glorified a state, he justified it, rationalized it and therefore, it was basically culmination of that process. So, I think what I am trying to uh, basically share here is that it has a it has a multifaceted nature Hegel's thought. It has been appropriated by different traditions. It has been a matter of debate and interpretation. A lot of people believe that Hegel was responsible for the birth of totalitarianism. Many people would argue that Hegel's ideas were responsible for the entire concept of positive state as it developed within liberalism. Many people would believe that you know the kind of liberative thought which Karl Marx propounded uh, through his ideas of socialism and communism. In fact, there was in, you know important element and component of Hegel's ideas there too, particularly in terms of the method of dialectics which Marx borrowed from Hegel. So, therefore, these are the issues related to or while interpreting Hegel, we have to confront all these issues. But nonetheless, we have to basically look at his ideas, his thought in order to basically evaluate that where he stands and what was his basically argument, what he was trying to basically argue. Now, before we move on to his ideas, the two things are important, his upbringing, his entire you know career and uh, the kind of background he had because as we normally know that for political thinker these things matter because they shape to a great extent the evolution of ideas of a thinker. Now, Hegel uh, was a German philosopher. Now, of course, as we have discussed he was exponent of idealism. Of course, Hegel came from a middle class family, a protestant family. Now, he took to academic career after attaining uh, his education and therefore, it is also significant that it was not a kind of uh, you know it, it was by uh, you know by career that he was a professional philosopher, a professional academician. It was not his vocation only, but it was also his profession. Now, uh, he taught at several universities, particularly in Switzerland and Germany, but finally in 1818 he was offered a chair in University of Berlin as a professor of philosophy and whole of his life Hegel was professor at Berlin University as professor of philosophy. Now, his reputation as academicians or intellectual of high caliber was not confined to only academia, but even society as a whole was aware of his 
presents his ideas and his thought. That was the kind of influence he uh, rendered on his contemporaries and on his successors. Now, uh, because of the justification which he offered uh, for uh, the German state at that time, because as it is well known that Germany was uh, struggling with this question of unity, the question of the formation of nation state, which perhaps other uh, societies, European societies had accomplished quite early. Therefore, his entire justification of uh, the power of the German state or one can say that not German state, but state as a whole, of course, uh, one could relate it to the Germany that made him quite popular and that also made him little bit uncommon because that was the period when there was another trend, another thinking which was basically gaining ground that was uh, laissez-faireism and so on and so forth, particularly within liberalism. Now, his famous statement that a state is the march of God on the earth became quite popular, a kind of dictum which even today people remember. Now, uh, in fact, what happened that some of the thinkers, European thinkers around that time, particularly the followers of Edmund Burke and Rousseau, when they talked of a state or nation state, they talked of marginally, but in Hegel's political thought, state became so central that Hegel's ideas and Hegel's political thought drew a lot of attention of his contemporaries. Now, as an academician, as a professor, as a philosopher, trained philosopher, Hegel produced many writings and some of the writings uh, are still uh, referred, some of the writings are still influential and some of the writings are still referred, particularly when we discuss philosophy and political thought. Particularly one important writing which shaped, you know, this uh, entire uh, discourse uh, of politics even later, particularly on freedom. Uh, and other issues. In fact, this philosophy of rights, which he published in 1821, uh, can be considered as very important writing from the point of view of politics and political ideas. But there were many other, you know, important writings which he produced. For example, Phenomenology of Spirit, 1807, The Science of Logic, 1812, then Encyclopedia of Philosophical Sciences, 1817. Even some of his lectures were posthumously published. Uh, the lectures he used to deliver to his own university as well as several other places. For example, philosophy of history, history of philosophy, philosophy of religion. These are basically the compilation or, or the lectures which he delivered and they were published later after his death. So, they, are, they were only posthumously published. Now, the main political thought of Hegel, normally people, uh, you know, trace to this important writing called Philosophy of Rights, which we have just now seen was published in 1821. Now, of course, this method we have already hinted and we will discuss more extensively later, but you know, the entire political philosophy has a methodological, methodological rigor and that could be seen in terms of his enunciation or a kind of uh, you know articulation which he made of his dialectical method. Now, of course, uh, you know it was uh, in, in fact put in his uh, science of logic and also in encyclopedia of philosophical sciences, the two writings, but you know even the traces of this dialectics one can find in his uh, you know philosophy of spirit and also uh, some other writings which he produced and some of them we have just now seen. In fact, they also have the traces of this method of, uh, you know, dialectics which became integral to his political thought. Now, one thing is important here to remember that Hegel, uh, you know, for Hegel the history uh, in explanation of history was very important and significant. And in his hands, it became a philosophy of history, not the chronology, but philosophy that how history moves, what are the causal, you know, connection, what are the, what are the causalities in history, what, you know, makes history to move. And it is here, as I mentioned, that idealist 
Hegel believed that it is not the material force, not the matter which is the driving force of history as subsequently Karl Marx uh, you know argued, but it is the ideas. Basically, ideas are the motor force of history. Now, his political philosophy or political thought was deeply embedded in the philosophical approach and particularly this philosophy of history. And this dialectical idealism that is history is moving uh, through the force of history ideas and there is a dialectical uh, you know process through which these things are moving. We will just see that how this dialectics was you know talked about in Hegel. Now, uh, you know what happened is dialectical idealism uh, in Hegel implies two, three things related things. Number one that there is an idea and one can call it a spirit of consciousness and that idea is you know the basic substance of universe which includes physical, social and political institutions. It did not make a distinction between political, social and physical institutions. All our institutions uh, taken together have this spirit of consciousness or one can say idea and this is the basic substance. Number two that each social institution uh, represents the manifestation of the prevailing form of that idea at a particular historical point that is also very significant. And the third uh, you know important component is that idea has a capacity and tendency to develop there is a continuous progression, continuous movement towards the higher. So, therefore, there is, I, there is a tendency in ideas uh, or there is a capacity in it to develop and develop further. And then there is also one another aspect of this entire you know dialectical idealism in hands of Hegel is that ideas always move, move in a dialectical uh, on a dialectical path. Now, what happens that this, this is here that we have to understand this dialectical path that what is this dialectical path which is a mythological basically essence of his argument. Now, this dialectical path uh, in, in, in writings of Hethel, Hegel becomes uh, a kind of process which moves through negation of negation that every uh, thing has inherent uh, you know content to negate. So, therefore, this is perhaps one of the reason for the evolution or movement or you know further growth. Now, for example, we can take example that there is an initial idea and that initial idea when it gets confronted with a contradictory idea, then what happened that that confront confrontation between the two ideas, the initial idea and the idea which emerges as a negation of it or the contradiction of it, as a confrontation what happens that destruction of the untenable parts of the two uh, take place. That if two ideas get confronted, then what happened that confrontation leads to the destruction of untenable parts of the both ideas. And therefore, what happens that integration, this destruction of untenable part takes place, but simultaneously integration also takes place and that integration is integration of the tenable parts of the two ideas. Now, this process of idea getting confronted with uh, you know its antithesis or you know opposite idea and then the untenable parts uh, getting smashed away and then you know the integration of the tenable parts and this process goes on uh, repeating uh, you know till it reaches the stage where you know absolute idea emerges where you have you know the only tenable parts left and all untenable parts are thrown apart. So, therefore, this process becomes uh, a process in which you have a thesis that is initial idea then it gets its antithesis in the subsequent you know the subsequent idea which comes into contradiction with it and then antithesis and thesis this confrontation this conflict goes on and on till this synthesis happens and of course, synthesis the initial synthesis would be there, but the initial synthesis will have uh, again uh, the content of some untenable part. So, therefore, again you know the, it will come into conflict or confrontation with another idea. So, this thesis, antithesis and synthesis process goes on and on till the stage or till the point when it reaches where the final synthesis takes place and that synthesis is basically the absolute idea. So, this is something what he conceived as dialectical idealism. This is how you know uh, things move, this is how all ideas move. 
with the natural, social, political, all had ideas have similar progression through this thesis, antithesis and synthesis that is negation of negation that one idea negated by another idea and this process goes on and on till the point that when that final synthesis happens, when this negation stops and this synthesis is the synthesis of absolute idea that is the rational idea. So, this is how he understood this uh, dialectical uh, you know idealism. Now, dialectics as I mentioned earlier uh, was not invented. Uh, by Hegel, uh, we knew it uh, or today we know it as part integral part of the Greek political tradition. Plato uh, in fact made use of it, even in uh, you know other thinkers in Europe uh, also talked of it. For example, Kant employed this dialectics to a study uh, in a study of contradictions uh, of region and uh, versus the sense experiences. Uh, so, therefore, in fact, uh, you know there was a great amount of usage of this dialectics as a method even uh, before Hegel. But what is significant about Hegel that Hegel deployed it to arrive at a higher plane of truth and therefore, the way he uh, deployed it to arrive at a higher plane of truth and number two, the way he deployed it to understand social and political process was quite significant. Now, uh, for example, as I mentioned that initial idea in Hegel hands, Hegel hands becomes thesis, opposite idea becomes antithesis and the result of this class result you know causes this synthesis which is basically nearer the truth. But one thing is also significant that he says that it is not that this initial idea may not have any amount of truth or the negation which takes place is also totally devoid of truth. Truth may have been present in both. But what happens that when the synthesis takes place, when this absolute idea emerges due to the synthesis, it is perhaps more closer to truth. So, therefore, what happens that Hegel argues that the initial synthesis, because I told you it is a long process, the initial synthesis between thesis and antithesis, uh, you know, uh, is all, always from, uh, you know, far from perfection. So, this perfection this drive towards perfection is a part of this natural process and that basically results only when this final synthesis takes place. And he in his scheme of things as you will discuss that a state is basically the culmination of that process which is one can say the synthesis of number of theses and antitheses. For example, individual, family, civil society and finally, the state is the synthesis which is basically nearer to the truth or one can say the absolute idea which is perhaps more liberative, more emancipatory and perhaps people can find their destiny in that. So, therefore, uh, you know this is how he looked at this dialectical uh, you know idealism. Now, uh, you know this uh, contradiction, contradiction of opposites as he talked of uh, go on and on repeating itself uh, and you know until the point that it reaches that absolute truth. Because I told you that that does mean that initial process did not have truth, they also had truth, but not the absolute truth may have some amount of truth. So, therefore, you know he often used this term negation of the negation. Now, uh, you know one thing is uh, uh, important here that uh, in his hands this dialectical idealism uh, became a tool through which he gave a full fledged philosophy of history that how this history uh, takes place. And therefore, this is another significant uh, you know contribution of Hegel. Now, what happened that uh, you know uh, uh, you know this uh, entire interpretation or the philosophy of his, his history uh, which he uh, pro, you know propounded uh, you know is uh, you know directed or basically structured uh, in direction of uh, understanding this individual quest for freedom. Because what is this freedom? Because of, to, of course, the individual and its freedom uh, were not something which only Hegel talked of. Uh, even before Hegel, we have seen in our earlier lectures that whole liberal political thought was grappling with this issue, the social contract theories. Even uh, you know some other traditions, uh, you know, uh, in ancient and uh, in modern times, uh, talked about freedom. But in Hegel hands, this entire quest for individual freedom, uh, you know. Uh, changes completely or takes a new turn. For example, in Hegel's scheme of things, everything passes uh, from undifferentiated beginning uh, to more uh, determined end. For example, uh, he can he would give the example of a man from a primitive 
that is undifferentiated consciousness to final, finally self realize and you know self conscious individual. So, this differentiation is perhaps the destiny of human beings. But in fact, this is how history moves and how history moves in fact, as we have seen earlier there is the ideas which make history to move. For example, what happens that we know about the primitive societies, we know about uh, you know certain tribal societies today that how they are undifferentiated in terms of functions and the roles and that undifferentiated society when it moves in direction of differentiated society uh, what one normally we call the modern society. So, what happens this movement uh, is basically uh, taken account of uh, in huge scheme of things. For example, uh, you know what is significant here that instead of giving primacy or importance to individual actions, Hegel gives importance to social actions, social networks and social relationship. So, therefore, what happens in Hegel that social interaction uh, precedes the creation of individual. It is not the matter of individual choice, but rather it is individual destiny or is the compulsion that people have to act in a social context. So, therefore, this argument ran contrary to what was being argued within liberal political uh, thought. Now, even in terms of freedom, Hegel would not say that freedom is a matter of individual choice. He, he rather he would like to put it uh, you know that uh, you know rather he would like to question the liberal uh, you know you know position or one can say the utilitarian uh, you know calculus of individual freedom in terms of individual and individual choice. Now, what happens that Hegel uh, for Hegel freedom is you know intimately tied to uh, social necessity and this basically is continuously uh, you know uh, Con continuously this uh, you know social necessity continuously uh, you know uh, refines itself in consciousness. Now, this social necessity freedom as social necessity this is one dimension which was something totally different and new uh, in that period when Hegel was writing and talking about it. And it is perhaps this social nature of freedom which also became integral to Marx's political thought that how uh, you know freedom uh, is socially constructed how freedom is socially determined which was not there in you know the liberal political uh, tradition. Now, what happened that this process from undifferentiated to differentiated what happened that individually defined goals are transcended by a more and more socially defined goals in Hegel's scheme of things An atomized individual cannot realize his freedom. The kind of atomized society which was being anticipated, imagined, visualized and being propounded within the liberal tradition. Hegel is very you know emphatic and definitive about this that an atomized individual cannot realize his freedom that means, the freedom is possible only within the network of social relationship or within society. Only the social institutions which represent the higher plane of region according to Hegel, Hegel are not created for the furtherance of individual oriented goals, but they are rather there to promote the socially constructed goals and social socially determined freedom. <coughs> so, therefore, what we find that you know in Hegel this function uh, of uh, you know moving from undifferentiated to differentiated from individual to social and all these things uh, you know what happened uh, leads him to a kind of trajectory in his political thought in which the four important institutions come into picture and they are basically family, civil society and state three institutions family, civil society and state that individual leads to family, family leads to civil society and civil society uh, leads to a state. So, therefore, basically what happens that freedom of self in Hegel is a basically social self. Uh, not the uh, individual self. So, you know this identity the entire individual identity is turned from individual to social and therefore, this is quite important and for freedom this you know realization of this self and this identity in Hegel becomes important. Of course, lot of people also make comparison between Hegel's political thought and some other counterparts in Indian tradition where this realization of self through this identity which is historically uh, you know evolved process 
from individual one goes to a new identity that is family and that family turns into another identity that is civil society and finally, civil society culminates into or sublimates into uh, you know a state. This continuous chain of identity formation and this is how freedom is postulated. Many people feel that this is uh, in contradiction or basically this is contrary to what the another tradition uh, in India which talked of renunciative freedom that it is not continuous assertion of self and identity, but rather effacing identity or transcending identity or renounce you know renouncing that identity one can attain freedom. So, of course, uh, you know there is a different debate there the renunciative freedom and the kind of freedom Hegel is talk, no, talking of. But here in fact what we are trying to say that this entire philosophy of history uh, Hegel is giving in terms of individual quest for freedom and that individual quest he is locating in terms of the evolution of societies from undifferentiated to differentiated from simple to complex and this is how he basically moves from individual to a group identity of individual, identity of individual within social networks and social settings. And therefore, what happens that that settings lead him to argue that individual basically freedom requires that individual enters into a family that is perhaps the first important moment for attainment or realization of freedom that is family. Now, this family civil society and state this troika one can say or this entire a network you know are crucial for understanding Hegel's idea of freedom. Now, this relationship between family civil society and state uh, is the relationship existing in dialectical fashion. So, there is a dialectical relationship. Now, what happens that all three of them uh, represents three different uh, moments in the evolution of history. These three represent three moments for the attainment of freedom individual freedom. Now, family according to this scheme of things in Hegel uh, represents unity that is uh, you know the unity among people you know a lot of people come together wife and husband uh, you know parents and children uh, parents uh, and grandparents. So, I mean this is a unity of multiple relationships and therefore, this is institution which represents unity. But then the next institution where multiple families come together and interact and create another network of relationship which in his words is civil society and we will discuss that how this is very important contribution in Hegel when he makes a distinction between civil society and state. Because in his predecessors particularly in the social contract theorist like Locke and Rousseau civil society and state uh, were basically used coterminously. Uh, civil society was confused with the state and civil society and state both were differentiated from state of nature. But in Hegel for the first time we are finding a different and distinctive, distinctive meaning attached to the civil society where he makes civil society as a realm of economy of basically interdependence of economic activity commerce trade and so on and so forth a voluntary contractual relationship. Of course, in Locke and Rousseau also it is posited as a contractual relationship, but that relationship is also confused with uh, something what is called state, but Hegel makes a distinctive uh, you know uh, uh, definition of this civil society. So, therefore, the family represents this unity. Whereas, the civil society represents in this scheme of sins a particularity. So, therefore, in this dialectical fashion one can say that family becomes the thesis that a unity becomes the thesis and its opposite idea one who gets in civil society that is the antithesis that is particular from families stands for unity, but fam in a civil society and stands for particular interest. Uh, individual interests. And number three, the third institution comes into picture that is the state and state represents uh, neither uh, unity nor particularity uh, which is represented by civil society, but a state rather represents universality. So, therefore, you have a synthesis of these two ideas unity and particularity get confronted with each other thesis meets antithesis and therefore, what results uh, as a process you know as a part of this dialectical process is the synthesis and that synthesis is universality. Now, therefore, what happens that they together uh, I mean all three of them together enrich human life and therefore, continue contribute toward the sublimation of human nature that human nature is now getting sublimated from individual to family 
family to civil society and civil society to a state. So therefore, what happens that this is how he uh, makes his you know proposition about this individual quest for freedom as a social process and as a sublimation of human nature and human identity from individual to family to civil society and state. Now, one of the important commentator on Hegel, Avinelli, uh, he you know argues that for Hegel, uh, the ethical nature of this social uh, you know existence uh, in his uh, scheme of things has three moments uh, and those three moments uh, you know in their totality capture the multi faceted nature of human life and all three of them according to Avenary are network of human relationship organized according to the different uh, principles and their dialectical relationship give full meaning to the richness of human life. And these three moments are the moment of family, the moment of civil society and moment of state. Now to begin with the family that is the initial idea one can say in his uh, dialectical idealist framework is thesis. This thesis called family is basically the first institution where individual transcends his ego through altruism because in his uh, you know, uh, you know, in his framework, family stands for altruism. Altruism means that sense of sacrifice, that people are ready to sacrifice. Father is ready to sacrifice for children, wife is ready to sacrifice for husband. So there is a sense of altruism in family. Now what happens that this is the first moment where the civilizing and liberating process are set in. Because for the first time, individual gets this civilizing experience and a liberative uh, feeling. What happens that in, in ha for example, in happy marriage, what happens that unity grows uh, both, uh, you know, material and spiritual senses uh, because the objectives are both material and spiritual. It is not only material. What happened that this physical union uh, of pleasure and pain sharing, uh, you know, along with the sense of having a common property, uh, you know, creates a union. Uh, and that is a union of responsibility and that transforms this physical union into a more a spiritual type or the physical union in you know into a union of minds, ideas and souls. So therefore, this family becomes the loci of the first moment of this experience of freedom. Now, it creates a kind of feeling of union of you know of feeling, love and faith in each other. So therefore, what happened that in relation to the natural love, uh, each in family transcends one own self and becomes part of the whole. So therefore, a kind of altruism comes into picture, a sense of sacrifice that one, one's own self, one's own interest, one's own identity is there, but it is not more important than the common interests of the family. So therefore, what happened that a mutual self-renunciation takes place and therefore that is called altruism or one can say that family as a loci of unity based on the principle of uh, you know altruism. Now what happens that but family according to Hegel does not provide the final uh, means for self-realization and this is perhaps perhaps what leads to the second moment or the second stage in this evolution of ideas and evolution of the institution. Now, according to Avinelli, the family is based on this particularistic altruism. Altruism is there, the sense of sacrifice, the feeling to sacrifice for others is definitely there, but it is particularistic, but it is not universalistic. That universality, universalistic sense of altruism, uh, you know, comes only with the coming of the state, which we will discuss later. So what happens that this particular this particularistic altruism is a relationship limited to the particular uh, you know needs a particular set of people uh, who are basically uh, only the family members. So therefore, this entire uh, range of altruism is limited. Now, of course, there is no denying the fact that a family is the cradle of virtue. Man transcends you know self-interest and moves from egoism to altru altruism uh, only because of this. Uh, experience or this moment within the family. So therefore, the first lesson of virtue is taught within the family itself. And therefore, family has important role to play in human history so far as this quest for freedom is concerned or the continuous movement towards 
freedom is concerned. For example, as a younger, you know, but this process will not stop with the family and this differentiation will take place. This movement from family to civil society has to take place because what happens as younger mem members of the family grow up and they are therefore, when they grow up, their needs get increased, their requirements, their objectives, their goals, you know, also get changed and therefore what happens that family, the individual family starts getting dissolved and basically a transition, a new transition uh, takes place and that new transition is the creation of civil society. So therefore civil society what happens that civil society emerges uh, on the ruins of the family because family disintegrates uh, into the plurality of families, number of families come together and they create a civil society. Now for example, some become the head of the new families, daughters uh, get married to other families. So there are number of families created and this multiple relationships of families ultimately lead to the civil society. Now what happens that this is at the level of idea. That does not mean that family as an institution dis disintegrates and dissolves and disappears completely. But basically the purpose is to say that how this entire concept of civil society comes into existence. When the relationship, the network of relationship moves beyond families, there is another plane, another terrain, another sphere where people start interacting and that sphere is higher than the family where different families come and that start interacting. What is also normally referred in, uh, you know, in political theory, uh, uh, you know, as a public sphere. So this is a realm of public sphere where basically from the private, from the secluded, from the individual sphere, individuals move to a more higher plane that is a public plane where number of individuals from number of families, they come together and they start interacting. And this is perhaps the idea behind this concept of civil society. But as you will see that in Hegel's hand, this idea of civil society acquires a new meaning. It is different from the meaning which was at, at, you know, attached to it by the social contract theorists like Locke and Rousseau. And therefore, his contribution on this entire concept of civil society has been so significant that Today when we discuss civil society, we cannot uh, ignore Hegel's definition or Hegel's argument or Hegel's ideas. So much so that even Marx uh, recognized and uh, you know the value and uh, utility of this category called civil society. Because for Hegel, civil society is a realm of economy. He civil society in other words can say is a sphere of market. Uh, you, here you have this exchange relationship where you have these various individual interests coming, coalescing and basically interacting. So this entire sphere of economic activity which is called civil society by Hegel was acknowledged, recognized and basically uh, you know uh, also used by Marx more or less in the same fashion. But the differences started uh, on the argument to transcend this sphere because ultimately it was recognized both by Hegel and Marx that civil society has inherent limitations. So it cannot act as the sphere for freedom. There is a constant, the going constant on freedom. How individuals can acquire freedom, which was a kind of issue which Hegel was struggling and the kind of issue which Marx was struggling. But Hegel proposed that this, uh, you know, reconciliation or the synthesis could be found in the state. That a state could be the higher sphere where perhaps both thesis and antithesis would get neutralized and a better synthesis, more closer to, to th happen would arrive and that will be the institution of a state. And it is here that Marx breaks from Hegel because for Marx, civil society's contradictions cannot be resolved by the state because the state itself is extension of that contradiction. A state is in fact in his uh, opinion or in his words is the managing committee of the same forces which are not allowing freedom to crystallize in civil society that is the bourgeoisie, the capitalist class. Because in his opinion, the civil society is nothing but a realm of economy, the market society and the bourgeois society. And therefore, there is inherent limitation on freedom. And therefore, a state cannot basically, uh, you know, restore that freedom because the state is the extension of the same forces, contradictions or he said the managing committee of the bourgeoisie as Marx put it. But in Hegel, that was not the case of what Marx argued because Hegel believed that a state is the synthesis of the two conflicting ideas. The first thesis that is family and its antithesis that is 
of civil society. The family is individual, you know, realm of individual or one can say is altruism, but particularistic altruism and civil society is basically based on egoism. So, therefore, what happens that only a state when you have universalistic altruism takes place and therefore, that becomes the realm of freedom. So, this is how uh, you know he looked at this relationship. Now, what happened that uh, you know uh, you know this is how this transition takes place from family to civil society. Now, family disintegrates into the plurality of relationships as we just saw and therefore, what happens that a further development of a spirit according to his uh, you know dialectical idealism as we saw that ideas are you know causing this movement of history or the driving force of history. So, there is a further development of human spirit and what happened that development takes place in a larger society and therefore, that results into the formation of civil society. Now, civil society helps in transcending this particularistic altruism of family as we have seen earlier into a universalistic egoism. There is some amount of universalism uh, there in civil society instead of particularism of family, but instead of altruism of family, it is replaced by uh, egoism and therefore, this cannot be the moment of freedom or cannot be the site of freedom. So, therefore, what happens a new institution comes into picture that is civil society and he calls it a universal institution of universal egoism. Uh, in fact, it is a step in direction of self realization or self self aggrandizement or one fulfillment of one's own self interest or the material interest. Now, of course, as I mentioned earlier that it is here that one finds a very important uh, break from uh, his predecessors, particularly the two uh, important thinkers, modern thinkers, one British, another uh, you know French uh, Locke and Rousseau, the two social contract theorists who also made use of this category called civil society, but they made use of civil society in order to differentiate it from a state of nature. That after a state of nature, the kind of problems which human being faced you know in a state of nature, they entered into a mutual understanding and contract and moved away from that state of nature and then they form a kind of uh, you know uh, institution which in their opinion was a state, but you know the description of the state resembles with the description of civil society, but they call it state not civil society. But here we find that there is a definitive and distinctive uh, meaning attached to civil society and it is here one can say that Hegel becomes more profound in the sense that he makes a distinction between civil society and a state as uh, we have just seen uh, we have just seen that how he finds a state as synthesizing the elements of family and civil society and making it you know the site of freedom. So, therefore, this Locke and Rousseau's tradition he basically breaks from. Now, Hegel uh, therefore, the civil society uh, is important stays in the development of history, but nonetheless it has uh, you know uh, own limitation. For example, it is a realm of individual who had left the unity of family to enter into economic relationship. There were material compulsions, there were other compulsions, psychological compulsions which force individuals to relinquish uh, the site of unity that was family and move into this civil society. So, therefore, it is arena of pursuing self interest and competition. So, therefore, there is less sense of mutuality. In fact, such institution in uh, opinion of Hegel cannot serve a common good or universal interest as perhaps Locke, Rousseau and many other liberal thinkers argued and believed. So, Hegel therefore finds a limitation with this institution called civil society. Now, he is looking for a better replacement or better synthesis where in fact, the limitation of both family and civil society uh, could be uh, you know found out and he finds it in the state as a distinguished from civil society a state is capable of serving this universal interest. Now, civil society therefore, in Hegel's opinion is aggregate of isolated individuals pursuing self interest. So, one can say that it is a atomized society, society uh, where individuals live a life of atoms have relationship with each other, but those relationships are largely conditioned and governed by governed by material interests. So, therefore, civil society uh, is a site of universal 
you know egoism are not a particular it is not you know it stands for particularism of family it definitely stands for universalism because relationships are more at a higher plane and more universal level compared to family but then there is a great amount of egoism here in fact people relate to each other uh, you know not on basis of uh, you know on uh, mutuality and altruism but on basis of self interest so therefore what happens that the civil society uh, in fact cannot ensure freedom for individual so therefore what happened that cut throat competition takes place uh, and that is basically the feature of a market society and this is how subsequently marx also defined and explained it and this is perhaps here that one can say that uh, the commonality between hegel and marx also blacks because marx started looking for a different solution and the solution he found out in socialism and communism where basically the state will wither away there will be total voluntarism and the kind of problem which the civil society face largely on account of production private ownership and property and other institutions you know they will be taken care of collectively and therefore it will herald a new society a new moment of freedom whereas hegel believed that this civil society and its limitations could be overcome by positing another third institution on this evolutionary scale and that is the state which will be the real site of freedom now what happens that what uh, you know this entire argument uh, of hegel uh, in terms of this civil society family and state uh, you know took all together a different trajectory now what happens that hegel even calls the civil society as external state which was basically confused by liberals as a whole that it is a state but it is external state it is not a state per se and therefore most of the liberals as i was just discussing when they talked of uh, you know civil society or when they talked of a state they talked in a manner where there didn't appear to be any difference between civil society uh, and the state example for example hegel would say that civil society is you know an institution based on voluntarism members have a contractual relationship with each other uh, in fact it is a unity of individuals as uh, you know in partnership uh, in for partnership means that people have certain defined interests and defined goals and objectives so therefore what happens that civil society is only a means to fulfill certain needs and therefore what happens that you know the state is slightly higher on higher plane where you have universalistic altruism where you know a kind of sense of sacrifice uh, for others as a citizen for example serving in army going giving taxes and other things without knowing the fact that you are not going to be individually benefited by those actions but still you perform it because you have a common good or common mission uh, before you so therefore the state uh, is functioning or a state functions on basis of certain commonality certain universalistic principles or certain universalism which lacks in civil society now what happened that uh, one important element which we also find in hegel and that is perhaps integrally related to his entire concept of freedom is his concept of labor and he feels that what distinguishes a human being from animal is the labor and that labor through his consciousness in fact this labor is the mediation of consciousness only through labor that this you know human being can mediate with uh, nature so labor is a important uh, component of uh, you know human character now this uh, freedom therefore for hegel requires you know the rising above uh, nature or the animal character and that is only possible when you go beyond beyond satisfaction of your physical needs and that is perhaps on the basis of the romanticization of this state of nature which was taking place in rousseau and many other predecessors of hegel uh, you know hobbes believed that this romantic romanticization was not done because you know attainment of freedom requires that human has to basically go beyond uh, you know or to basically uh, you know to go beyond or uh, you know the nature or one can act on the nature then only you know that uh, freedom is possible so therefore this commodification uh, as a as a process to fulfill human needs that commodification commodification means that growth or production or the continuous relationship between human being and nature and that relationship when it leads to uh, you know the production 
higher level of production that also is important stage in the attainment of human freedom and human liberation and that takes place only because of human labor through which human being is differentiated from animal so therefore labor is a mediatory uh, has a mediatory role between human nature and uh, you know the and and the nature physical nature so therefore this is how he also looks at the relationship between human beings history nature and freedom now what happened that this entire framework therefore what happens that hegel argues that for attainment of freedom this history moves from individual family civil society to a state and a state therefore become the final site of uh, you know freedom and therefore he calls it the universal altruism uh, whereas the other institutions may have stood for uh, unity may have stood for other things but they were particularistic egoistic but it is only the state where you have the transcendence of all these uh, you know uh, dimensions now of course as i was mentioning that lot of criticisms lot of you know ex, uh, you know uh, interrogations of hegel's thought has taken place over the ages uh, many people believe that uh, hegel uh, hegel's ideas were responsible for birth of totalitarianism uh, whereas many people also argue that the kind of positive value attached to a state was responsible for Uh, the emergence of the positive nature of a state uh, particularly in hands of green and others uh, one there are certain significant aspects with his thought which as we have seen that he was ahead of his time he laid the foundation for many new uh, you know uh, arguments and new m- many new trends in political philosophy and political thought on the question of slavery uh, the kind of tradition which existed in ancient time greek time as you have seen in case of aristotle when he completely denied virtue to slaves uh, in fact hegel broke from that tradition and considered slave as basically uh, you know the custodian of virtues because slave for him meant labor and he attached so much importance to labor the commodification acting on the nature working on nature and this production process and that is you know how it can play important role for you know attainment of freedom which also influenced subsequently the marxian writings in terms of labor commodification and freedom so therefore he creates many new uh, you know trends in the realm of political thought and therefore perhaps he is even today remembered as someone who really provided a path breaking in the pioneer ideas in modern period i will stop here Uh, thank you so much sir for such interesting and insightful lecture dear friends if you have any other questions and queries regarding this lecture please write us back on our e- official email id which will be showing just after this lecture and additionally i would like to tell you that there are many more lectures on the series of western political thoughts like uh, uh, Karl Marx, Bentham, and uh, G.S. Mill are lined up for our future lectures. So keep uh, watching, stay tuned with us. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you again, sir, for being here, and thank you so much for watching.